Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to the last lecture of this semester. So the um, today's the schedule will be as follows. So we're gonna have a about I think forty minute ish um of a lecture and then have a five minute break and then the remaining 30 minutes will be for final project presentations and um, if i remember correctly we have two presenters but um we might have more so let's see um uh, yeah actually it's something that um we're gonna just do actually as a, so we don't have an order here, but um, let me just check just one second um, to double check if actually um, I have a full list of the presenters. So the list will be determined by whether you submit the report or not yet, but then um, because like it's some people actually submitted the uh, proposals, but then they ended up not doing it so um that's why i think there are only two people but then um let me double check though Okay, looks like actually we have only only one submission. So uh, let me see. So I guess like it might be the case that uh, maybe. Oh, okay, okay, that's fine then. No problem at all. Yeah, I mean, if you're if you're using uh, no uh, no penalty late days, then it's fine. Yeah, okay. Then we have two. So we have uh, a Song Yun and Soyeon. So uh, Song Yun will present first, and then Soyeon. So I'll give you uh, up to ten minutes each. Okay, so let's get started with the lecture first. All right, do you see the slides? So today's topic will be, oh wait, <laughs> okay, I, I forgot to change the uh, topic. So it should be actually um, recent trade NLP, not GPT-2. And I think dates are wrong too. Oh, huh, my bad. It should be eighth, not sixth. Sorry about that. So the assignment three grades will be released next week. And we're aiming for uh, assignment four and final project grades to be in two weeks. So uh, yeah, you will get it around, um, I would say something like 23rd-ish. And then we'll aim for that. And then the attendance and participation and quiz grades will be also released next week. So you have some time to correct any wrong grades in the last few days. After today's lecture, 
there will be no class apparently. So uh, today's lecture is the last lecture or last class. So, but they will we'll, we'll keep communicating through the classroom and KLMS. So watch out for the um, those um, emails announcements so that you don't miss any important announcements. Okay. So any question about these? All right, so um, today's outline. So we're gonna talk about a few important advancements in recent years, especially I would say in recent two years. So starting from GPT, I mean, starting from actually GPT-2, which we covered last week. And then um, we're gonna talk about this paper called Scaling Laws, which was released in the early 2020, and then GPT-3, and then um, some of the recent trends that actually um, shape how large language models or the research in these language models are approached from the companies and the academia. And we'll just conclude with a um, relatively, I would say, um, very speculative hypothesis. Uh, so yeah, uh, it's you have done a lot of things in this class. So apparently we have covered almost everything except for um, we kind of did in context learning a bit in last last class, last lecture and lab. So we kind of tried to do it with the uh, GPT-2, but we call that, of course, um, GPT-2 was more of a just showing the possibility rather than um, providing any realistic quality that can be used for products. So it was more of a, oh yeah, it kind of works. It's not really usable. It's not useful yet, but uh, it kind of works. The fact that we can give some um, instructions and the examples in the prompt for language models, and then it does some zero shot or fuchsia learning. It only showed the fuchsia learning case for the um, for machine translation. So, but anyways, there were some um, um, uh, there was a there were some sign that's working. And then um, now we need to. So GPT-2, remember that was released in um, um, early 2019. So it was February, 2019. And then uh, the researchers at OpenAI were interested in, after seeing certainly some advancement from GPT-1 to 2 without changing anything else, but the size here, the size is uh, language model size and the data size and also batch size, they were surely interested in how far they can go with this. If they increase the, uh, the model size more and more, then would they be able to get much better performance and something that can be much better than the, the um, GPT-2? So that's why they did this experiment, which was uh, released, the paper was released in early 2020, whether, how does the scale and the language models um, performance or the perplexity will really have a, a uh, relate to each other? And the, the, the actually the message of the paper was quite clear. Large, large language models are strictly better. Although it, this actually is also being kind of challenges sometimes these days, or I mean, in, in, in different perspectives, because um, um, sometimes people say that actually kind of um, dies, I mean, it kind of flattens as it gets bigger. Uh, I mean, so, well, I would say that it's still, uh, this message or this argument is still open to, I think, um, some objections, but I think it generally, at least it was true until the size of GPT-3, uh, which we'll get to after this paper. So, so what this diagram is showing is actually quite interesting. So it's, first of all, is the, look at this, the parameter, um, chart. So look at the, uh, first of all, y-axis. The y-axis is the test loss, which means basically the word better. So you can think of this as, of course, perplexity too, because loss is exactly, anyways, um, average of the um, each token's probability. So it's, it's very similar to perplexity. The scale is different, of course, but, um, and then if you look at the parameters, look at the, uh, the linear scale and also look at the x-axis is actually not linear, 
Um, but in fact, the uh, y is also not linear, really. I mean, they draw, do the y axis also with the log. So uh, actually, both axes are log, but then because y values are very low, you, you see it, it's not too much of a, um, I would say, difference between each um, steps. But then still, you see that the 5.6 minus 4.8 is 0.8. 4.8 minus 4.0 is also 0.8, but then the, the spacing increases as you go down, or if you look at the other way, the spacing decreases as you go up. So it's basically the loss is also log space. Okay. Um, but then the, um, yep, yeah, but then they actually have an even spacing of the markers, not the actual scale is even spaced. And if you look at the x axis, then you see that the um, it's 10 to power 5, 10 to power 7, 10 to power 9, they're evenly spaced. So it's certainly also log space, right? And we certainly see that there's linear relationship. So it's really um, interesting because it's very strictly linear, right? I mean, it's not even, you know, there isn't really much fluctuation at all. Like it's very linear. So, and that basically means that the model's parameters, I mean, model's loss just decreases in the um, in the log scale uh, space as the parameters increase, number of parameters of language model increases. And there was one important condition here, the, uh, given that it doesn't have any limitation on the data set size and also, um, let me see which one was it? I think just data set size, yeah. And if you look at also data, uh, the, the, the middle diagram, you see that the, the loss also decreases with uh, as the data set size increases, right? Uh, in a linear scale too. So this also has a uh, data set size as a variable, but then the number of parameters also has no limit here. So it can be any number of parameters uh, given that data set size. And basically these two things they are actually contributing towards both, uh, both of them are contributing towards the compute or the petaflops day. So petaflop is basically the number of operations and then you multiply that uh, with days. So that basically becomes um, petaflops times days, right? Um, so you see that the, it also has a linear scale. So in general, it's pretty clear that if you just put more computation into these language models, the loss just decreases. And it wasn't that hard for the team to really conjecture that, okay, we were only able to get up to here, which is probably around uh, one petaflop days. But then it's not too hard to predict that, okay, if we just increase that by tenfold, then we'll get here because the trend was so clear at least like from the, uh, the to 10 to the power of negative five to 10 to the power of negative one. So probably the trend continues, right? Um, okay. So that was like a biggest reason that the OpenAI was able to, was very confident that they can make the language model bigger and still get something out of it. it if, if it wasn't this uh, analysis, then it's, you know, it's not, it's not easy to get, it's not easy to be confident, right? That they, oh, is really the large language model helpful? But then um, with this analysis, it was quite obvious relatively. And actually the one more thing is that this uh, blue line represents basically each run of, um, so basically this is a collection of uh, several models when they actually get the best, um, loss and compute trade-off. But then you see that we have individual models um, as they have a more training steps, how they actually have loss changes. So it's kind of levels out, right? So uh, look at this single blue line. What that means is that uh, we are basically training from the left. And then as we train more, it goes to the right. And then of course it flattens out with certain par number of parameters and data set size. So the blue lines are basically, um, they are where the time is variable and other things are fixed, each blue line is. And, it's, and then basically they were able to just uh, use one point, 
that has a best best trade off between loss and compute, then it's they they flatten out, and it's really important because this also means that let's say you have a small data set and um, small parameters, then you're um, but then you can still increase compute time a lot by just training a lot, many epochs. So let's say you're looking at this one line. But then what it's saying is that even if you train a lot for that small model with small data set size, it's maybe better to just train a larger model with a shorter period of time, which at the end might have less compute, but get to better test loss much quickly. So that was actually quite surprising too, because um, I mean, in some sense, it means that even large language model, it's not just that they can uh, attain lower test loss at some point, but it also means that sometimes if you want to reduce the computational cost, then it makes more sense to actually train larger model for a shorter period of time than training um, smaller model for a longer period of time. Any question about this? Okay. So that's actually also quite visible in this uh, next diagram. So as you see, um, we have uh, two different models. One is uh, this purple model, um, not two different, but then let's say we are comparing between two different models. Uh, this purple um, model, and let's say we're comparing with the yellow model. So they have difference in the number of parameters. The purple model has uh, 10 to the power of three, yellow model has 10 to the power of nine. And we see that um, as we process more tokens, we have much lower loss than the smaller model. So um, that's that's actually quite obvious. But then you also see that the larger models require fewer samples to reach the same performance. And that's also relatively maybe not too surprising, but it's also kind of surprising because we thought that in traditional machine learning, uh, if you have a much smaller data then larger models will overfit. That's why we want to make sure that our model is not big enough. And actually that happens when the number of tokens or the data set size is very small. So in fact, the traditional machine learning, they actually are not wrong when the number of tokens are small here. But then when the number of tokens are bigger than say like a million, when the data set is sufficiently large and also the model size is sufficiently large, it is clear that there is a uh, the larger model is just as better than the small model at any time in terms of uh, um, how well they do based on the data set size. So they, that basically just uh, rejects the original, or I mean, very old, I, well, I mean, very long standing argument that when your data set size is small, then you should use smaller model. That's to a degree, right? I mean, because if, if data set size is really small, then yeah, probably you should use small model. But then if you're talking about uh, comparing between say like a million tokens versus like uh, 10 million, 100 million tokens, then it is always better to use larger model. That's what the paper is saying. Uh, it cannot really overfit well with, with, with respect to the uh, smaller models. Okay, so that's, that was actually also quite a surprising thing. People kind of knew this, but then um, I think this was one of the first analysis that made this very concrete. What's more surprising is what I just said in the previous uh, slide, it's actually showing more clearly here. Um, so let's suppose that we compare between this, again, purple model, but then with now some model in the, in, in the middle. Let's say like this blue model, do you see this model? So what's what's surprising here is which is also uh, also quite uh, which is also uh, which can be also ob obtained from the previous analysis in this um, diagram. If you compare this this purple and this blue line, what's surprising is that in order to reach, for instance, the same loss, sometimes not only it take it requires less number of tokens, but also it re might require less cost. So it's not just that it doesn't overfit, but then economically, if you want to save money, then you might want to use larger model, that smaller model, if you want to approach certain loss. So that's, that's also surprising, right? Because people would think that, um, well, larger models are only for 
uh, big companies that can endure the cost. But then if you don't have a, a large budget, then you should probably use smaller model. But then the, it turns out that at least in terms of training time, no, it's not the case. Of course, the inference time, smaller models will have a better uh, cost and the performance trade-off. So you have to think about that too. But then in terms of training, it's not even always the case that computational cost-wise, small models will be more beneficial because maybe large models will be able to reach what you're trying to get much faster with much less cost, basically. So basically, it, 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 uh, if you're trying to optimize training costs, then what it's saying is that probably you have to think about, um, well, yeah, where you stand in this diagram so that you can choose the optimal number of parameters to, um, well, basically obtain the loss with minimal computational cost. So at the end, um, the computational cost depends on largely three factors. One is uh, number of steps. Number two is the number of batch size. And number three is the model size. And what this is showing you is that the how much each influences the final loss. And um, basically, the, how they calculate this is maybe um, not super clear. Uh, but then uh, at least what they're trying to say is that, OK, uh, yes, it's true that if you have more compute, then the model is, will be better. But then you will have to still, if you, let's say, you have a budget of certain computational costs, then you have to um, think about how you will use the, your budget into these three things. Because suppose that you have uh, two models, which where the larger model has uh, twice the size of the first model, then computational cost will be also twice the size. Then if you are keeping the same budget, then you probably want to, uh, that means that you probably have uh, either, uh, well, smaller batch size or smaller zero steps um, than the larger, um, than the smaller model, right? If you want to keep the budget the same, but then, what this is saying is that, yes, it's good to have a um, large number of serial steps and large batch size, but then what matters most, first of all, is the model size. And then think about batch size. And then lastly, you can think about serial steps. So it basically shows you, this paper is showing you that, okay, you have to make the model big enough um, to reach the loss that you want to reach. Um, it's not really about time. I mean, but uh, zero steps is about time. It's not also really about uh, probably data parallel because best size is basically data parallel, right? You can, you can make the model data parallel easily with large best size, but then you might want to go model parallel because you want to have a larger model. So that's what the, uh, this paper was telling you. Um, I recommend you to actually read the paper too. It's very easy to read paper, uh, but then what the, mes the message is very powerful too. And also, um, you should also consider that this is almost now two and a half years old. So many of things here have been either um, refuted or also kind of extended. So it's not um, probably entirely like 100% correct. Everything is at, at the moment as of now, but then uh, it's still a very good read. And then four months later, it's not too surprising that they basically uh, OpenAI, the same team, released GPT-3 in May of uh, 2020. Because, I mean, yeah, even if it was, uh, I, I think everyone was very persuaded that, oh, yeah, I mean, they want to go here, right? I mean, they want to see what happens. Would it go like this forever, or is there any, like, uh, endpoint? So, um, in fact, GP3, in terms of the architecture and what it, the message that it's trying to convey, maybe not too, maybe not be too, too, too much different from GPT2, because the architecture is like almost exactly the same, and they 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 talk about zero shot and one shot, but this is not the first time they did. Uh, they also did this in GP2, but then I think the main message is that uh, number one, um, yeah, they are actually more focusing on this zero shot and one shot. So in GPT-2 was more of a, they were thinking of this as a more multi-test learning, but now here they're thinking of this as a really zero shot. Um, but number two is that, um, so basically they did very more careful study on how they can give the prompts and uh, examples. 
in the instruction, which is now people call it demonstration. Uh, when you actually have uh, the examples in, in the context, then you can think of that as a demonstration. Um, then, but then what's the more important message, I think, is the fact that they can do much better with large model. So this is not super new, but um, I mean, with respect to GPT-2, but uh, they were being, they're extending this to the, uh, the, as much as they could. And they were showing that zero to five examples as the input to the frozen language model can be served as training examples. And that's basically uh, last topic of uh, this loop map, mainly because uh, vanilla is that you basically do MLE, maximum likelihood estimation. Pre-training and fine-tuning is basically to transfer learning. And the, we have in-context learning, which is the language model is frozen. And then we try to fit in the examples through the input, not as a gradient flow or the gradient-based method. OK, so how, 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 how good was it? So let's see. So you can think of 1.3 billion parameters as GPT-2, by the way, because GPT-2 was, uh, if I remember correctly, was about like 1.5 billion. So it's very similar to GPT-2. And the architecture hasn't changed. Data kind of maybe um, increased a bit, but then it's not too much different. So um, you can think of this as uh, 1.3 billion parameters as the uh, GPT-2. And now you see that um, it's uh, like the accuracy is crazily different between 175 and 1.3. So they were showing just like the possibility with 1.3 billion parameters. But then 175 billion, it's like much higher. Like it's like about more than 10 times higher accuracy. Uh, wait, which one was this? I forgot what the data set this was about, but then, um, yeah, let me check that later. But uh, the point is that there is a large difference between different sizes and even like between 13 billion and 175 billion, there is a large gap. And you can think of 13 billion as a model that's um, similar size to the T5, the largest model. Okay. And then also, it's also interesting to see that the, the each model's performance increased a lot by the number of examples in the context. So they have tested up to something like, I think 30 examples. And then um, it's also interesting to see that the initially whether giving a prompt, which here prompt is basically this instructions like saying translate English to French uh, or other prompts like uh, classify the following sentence. It, it's actually quite also makes sense that the having this prompt initially helps a lot, but then as you have more examples, the prompt doesn't really serve a lot of a, um, purpose or it doesn't give additional benefits over no prompt. So it's actually also quite makes sense because if you have enough examples, then probably your prompt is not uh, super useful, as useful as in the zero shot or like one or two shot settings. And if you actually look at the numbers compared to the fine tuned state of the art, uh, these numbers were also amazing because um, let's say that you're talking about trivia QA, you didn't fine tune at all, GPT-3, but then it's able to reach uh, similar or better score than fine tuned state of the art with uh, up to like, uh, even if it's one shot, one shot being basically you have a um, instruction about the trivia QA, which is basically answering the question. And then you have one example of trivia QA and it reaches fine tuned state of the art or actually a bit worse maybe, but then, but then very similar to fine tuned state of the art. And then if you have a few shot like K equals 64, training examples then you can reach, um, oh, higher than the state of the art. And there is a benchmark co called a super, super glue. It's just basically classification benchmark. And uh, basically has a lot of uh, classification data sets. Uh, so if a model can score well on this data set, it means that the model is able to do diverse kinds of classification pretty well. And as you see, it is true that the uh, the model is not able to really reach the fine-tuned state of the art, but then still it it's better than the fine-tuned BERT. And BERT was very strong baseline, at least like uh, two years ago, one or two years ago from 2020 um, May, right? So it's really amazing too, because, well, if you can do this with really one shot, that means BERT has to had like something like uh, at least a few thousand examples with a train, but then you can approach that accuracy uh, 
very large accuracy with uh, one shot GP3 model. So that means then, in other words, if you were using very large for your classification task, you can replace that very large model with GP3 without any training example, or maybe just one example. And that has a huge implication to the products, right? Because um, that means that means basically you are actually able to um, deploy some service or some product that the user wants with just one or two examples and at the quality of BERT large fine tune on like a few thousand examples. And that actually has a, a lot of implication in the basically the industry too. It's like a very, very um, immediate availability of this kind of a service. And they also talk about the uh, how number of examples affect the in-context learning accuracy of, on superglue. It's just kind of obvious that, of course, zero shot has lower performance, but even just one shot, it's able to reach really high, high number. And if it's K-shot, then yeah, it goes up to like uh, above the very well fine-tuned bird. So there's a question from Nikita. Uh, in the old version of Hugging Face documentation, I found this. Note that if you're used to freezing the body of your pre trained model, the above may seem a bit strange as we are directly fine tuning the whole model without taking any precaution. It actually works better this way for trust models. Can you comment this? Um, so I'm not sure where this is coming from. It's I think the important. It's important to know the context. Is this from like tutorial? Okay, yeah, so, okay, yeah. So what I mean is that in computer vision, they, they're they much, it's much more common to actually have the entire model coming from, say, let's say you're transfer learning from classification to object detection. It's much more common to actually freeze the entire model. I think that, that's what they're talking about. Um, so, and they only fine tune the, um, the whatever comes after the frozen one but then i think they're trying to say this for those people who are coming from vision background because they think that freezing the model is more common but then um in like in the in the uh, bird or in the nlp it's more common to not freeze it when you're fine-tuning but then here i'm not talking about the uh freezing during fine-tuning it's more about actually we're not fine-tuning at all so it's a bit different um, case. Okay, question from Juno. So since larger model is required for better performance, would it mean that there will be a limit on achieving good performance on edge devices without internet connection? Uh, yes, I think so. I mean, um, of course people are trying to make really small, large models too. I mean, I mean, it's kind of, okay, that's that's not, we, yeah, you can, you can be a small, large model. I'm saying that there are small language models that actually work well, but then um, you're right. So basically, um, if you want, if you want your mobile device or your mobile app to be very good at language understanding, then probably you want to have uh, some internet connection and server server connection, basically. Okay. Yeah. Good questions. But again, it's very large model, right? So. Um, there were several different uh, sizes. They try from small, this is small to bird base, medium is small to bird um, large, and GP3 large is actually small to also, um, it's basically T5, um, I think large, because uh, you have decoder too, right? So, um, and XL is similar to T5 um, XL, X large. And, 13 billion is similar to T5XX large. And this was like first time that they reached this big size. You see like these numbers and it now goes up to like a hidden state size of 12,000. It's very large, number has 96. And best size of 3.2 million. And note that learning rate decreases as you have larger model. That's also important thing to really note. It decreases quite linearly. All right, so what, now we're done with everything in the roadmap. So um, if you have, um, if you know these things, I think, of course, there are new things. There are other things that we haven't covered. Uh, we couldn't cover everything, but 
for instance, we couldn't call much of a semantic parsing, but still, uh, you can still formulate semantic parsing as a, for instance, um, um, text generation problem. But anyways, you will be able to formulate most problems. You'll be able to uh, approach most NLP problems with these, um, um, I would say, techniques. Uh, okay, so let's now spend the rest of, uh, I would say, I'll just actually probably go up to uh, 545 and then we have a five minute break and we'll have uh, two presentations, okay? Um, so anyways, it's apparent that it's getting bigger and bigger. So we talk about Elmo and uh, BERT initially and then GPT-2, 1.5 billion and there was Megatron, we didn't talk about that, but and T5, 11 billion and then there was a Turing NLG, we didn't talk about this, but GPT-3 is now 175 billion and then again, we have a larger model too. Um, 530 billion. So where is this going to? Um, so I think there is a risk and also there's a lot of uh, opportunities that companies see. So risk being the fact that uh, training language model costs a lot. They cost a lot of uh, money. Like for instance, GPT-3, it's known that uh, if you want to train that on a cloud, then you will need one single training will require around like uh, $10 million. That's uh, what I heard, I think. If you want to actually have an infrastructure to actually train GPT-3 size, then you will need actually 10 times of that, which is like $100 million at least. And apparently then CO2 emission will be also very uh, uh, important thing because these actually consume a lot of electricity and they can, they are basically, um, you know, which means there are a lot of uh, carbon dioxide emissions. And there is also issue about training data extraction attack. Um, so it was uh, in, late 2020 that people found that um, you can actually uh, have certain queries into the GP2 so that the G2 2 can output whatever it saw during training. And that can be very, uh, very uh, containing very privacy information because we initially thought that these models will not, I mean, we can use any training data for these models, but then this paper basically, or the um, previous, a few previous works have shown that uh, we cannot be too, um, we have to be very careful about what training that we use too, because yes, we do not reveal or we do not um, actually make the training data available, but then the language model trained on the training data actually memorize them. And maybe if you have a very uh, good enough attack, then you might be able to extract those things. And it's really a coincidence that in Korea, this actually um, really, the, the worry that the Google researchers had happened in Korea. So in fact, we had a, in 20, uh, 2020, there was a service called uh, Iruda and uh, basically it's a conversation chatbot that a Korean startup made in late 2020. And then uh, it basically shut down. I think it's trying to reopen uh, recently. Maybe it's in under beta service, but then back then, uh, they had the service without the um, um, protection for this data extraction and people were able to extract the data that the model was trained on. And this data contained, for instance, um, like this bank account information and um, well, like a lot of the privacy information, like address and everything, names and these, these things, phone numbers. So uh, that's why people are really upset. And also that also meant that it actually violated the law so it was not just about, um, I think back then, there were several other reasons why the model, the service was also, I think, was condemned. But then uh, the, the, at the end, the, the most critical one was the fact that, that this was actually um, violating the privacy law. So hopefully, um, I think, I really hope that the, beta, the, the, the second version of this model uh, will be able to, um, you know, prevent these data extraction attacks. And yeah, there are a lot of work going on uh, in these companies to make sure that these language models are not too dangerous uh, in terms of different aspects. One of, one of those aspects is uh, like privacy. Another aspect is environment, um, et cetera. And there was also actually a lot of issue with regard to this I think almost two years ago, because these two um, researchers, or I mean, maybe uh, not in this not in this paper, but then some researchers actually in Google uh, had a dispute with their leaders about um, 
uh, ethics of the um, the ethic of uh, these large language models, and it was very a uh, very uh, big problem back then. And because um, we don't have much time, probably we're not we're not gonna watch this. Uh, but then I recommend you to watch this too. I uploaded the PDF online. But then Google is, but but then even though there are a lot of uh, risk involved with large language models. It is also certain that these models can be the future of many uh, future products that these large companies imagine. Um, so uh, they don't want to, of course, reduce the amount of investment into large language models. And some of the initial services started to appear last year. So it takes some time from, from research to actual products. But uh, if you can think of GPT-3 as uh, really the uh, research that uh, made the breakthrough in 2020. Then in 2021, we are starting to see we ha we have been uh, seeing some actual progresses in the in the product domain. So one of them is Google's Lambda. It's basically a chatbot that um, can do a lot of different things. It can actually um, uh, basically you know in this actually video you will see that the chatbot thinks itself is uh, I think Mars or uh, some planet, and then the a person is chatting with the uh, chatbot as if the chatbot is Mars and is asking like what 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 how much you weigh and then the chatbot says like I'm I'm weighing you know as much as the uh, basically the actually how much the Mars weigh right anyway okay. and also there are some more practical applications uh, for instance from Microsoft OpenAI or to more exact GitHub GitHub is basically acquired by Microsoft and um, OpenAI is supported by Microsoft a lot, so we can think of this as also a Microsoft product. Uh, these days, I think some of you are using this already. I'm also using this too. It's actually, it's better, but then still you can um, actually, um, you can get these, this service pretty easily. Um, so basically what it does is that you give this code, this part of the text, you, you write this yourself, import and some comments about what you're gonna write and then maybe the function signature, and then the computer writes the rest for you. And it's actually very accurate in many cases. And um, in fact, um, I realized that these days when I'm coding, actually sometimes if I'm stuck, how, how I mean, if I'm, when I'm stuck, how I, sh how, how I should write the next code, I sometimes actually wait for the GitHub uh, Copilot to complete my code. So I, I became very dependent on Copilot, mainly because Copilot was quite accurate in many cases. So uh, I recommend you to actually also try these out if you're uh, actively coding, because they are actually really good. And it's not that they just work on AI codes. Actually, they are more common in, I think, other kinds of code, like uh, web services, app, app applica applications for the smartphones, and uh, backend. Uh, a lot of languages it supports, not just Python. Apparently, this is not Python either. And in Korea also, there are a lot of investments from the uh, large companies. One, uh, I think notable example is Naver, Hyperclova. So you can also watch this too. It's quite interesting. It's I think from last year. Um, LG also has a lot of investment into this too, XL1. And it's clear that the, um, we're seeing a lot of uh, classification of um, these large language models because it cannot be deployed by um, many, I would say, small companies. But then it's also possible that these small companies have very um, good use cases of these large language models. So uh, what OpenAI, for instance, is doing is that, and also I think what Neighbor is also doing these days too, I think they call it Clova Studio, Hyper Clova Studio. Um, they basically open up the APIs so that the startups can use them. Uh, and then you saw that GP3 is able to do some really crazy things. So why don't, so what they're, what OpenAI is saying is that, why don't you use our large language models to do um, your job, your, I mean, your service in your startups. And of course um, they're, they're getting their, um, their profit model is basically they're charging um, per API call, but it's not too expensive at the moment. So it's very um, good to try out if you're also interested. And also uh, OpenAI doesn't stop there, but they also want to invest into these startups that they utilize their um, APIs. It's very strategic investments because if there are uh, some startups that 
first of all, become very dependent on these APIs, and number two, are very successful, then it makes sense for OpenAI to maybe later um, have a very close relationship, even like merging, right? So it's very, I think, smart move. And um, apart from that, there are a lot of also um, investments going into startups um, globally. And these startups are trying to basically compete with OpenAI or they're trying to, for instance, do something that OpenAI is not doing much, like, for instance, video understanding. Okay, so I'm going to end with this um, some uh, quite big speculation. So basically, I think uh, one of the interesting directions that we're seeing recently is the fact that large language models are actually not there. They're not just, well, good at being fine-tuned to certain tasks like BERT, but then if you get make it bigger and uh, if you train a certain way, then we start to see some very few shot or even zero shot learning. And at the end, I think many researchers in AI are really looking forward to this moment where uh, really lang can language models kind of be as good as human intelligence in uh, more tasks than now, and maybe more in more, um, I would say more similar to how humans behave, right? So of course, it doesn't mean that we always want that. Sometimes we just want the computers to be uh, different from humans and also much better than humans. Actually computers are much better than humans in certain ways already. So uh, we cannot say that that's always the desired case, but then it's certainly a difficult goal. And also certainly that many AI researchers are um, working on. And in that sense, then um, language model whether uh, I think the really big hypothesis in the next 10 years is whether a language model can be uh, improved where uh, to, a, to an extent that we can say uh, the language model is mimicking human intelligence um, or not, of course. And I think that's something that uh, um, I think the, a lot of uh, people here and also me um, are want to really uh, find out, well, as the basically uh, the I mean, whether how the where the research community goes, um, and also how the research progresses globally, of course. And of course, I think it'd be really great if you can contribute towards that progress too, uh, as a researcher. Um, so I think it's really exci exciting time of uh, doing NLP research. And I think in this class, I uh, compared to last semesters, I did not cover uh, too much of large language models. Actually, um, I tried to put more time on the the topics before BERT, and we had a also I only put very uh, I only put very small time after I think uh, BERT. So that's because also I think that the scope of this class is more of a, I think uh, I define it as a, um, something like pre twenty nineteen. After 2019, if, if, since 2020, there are so many large language models. I think it's becoming um, really a new, um, I think, important research area that uh, we, we might be able to actually make this into a new, uh, well, an independent class in KAIS. So uh, I hope to also um, encourage you to take those take, 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 take the class if we actually open that class. It might be next semester or this semester after, but. Uh, we might we might open a large language model class but anyways yeah i think uh that's it for this semester so hope you have enjoyed the class or the uh the entire course up to now we're gonna have a five minute break and then we're gonna come back at uh basically 9 55 and then uh we're gonna give 10 minutes each for each part uh each uh presenter including uh, Q&A, and they're gonna end the class at around 10.15. Uh, so see you in five minutes. And uh, Sangyeon is presenting first, so please, please be prepared.
Okay, let's get started with the final project presentations. So, Sonia, are you ready? Um, yes, uh, Professor, could you enable screen sharing, please? Sure. Yep. I'll make you co-host. And also, also make um, Soyoung co-host too. Um, okay, I'll start my presentation. Um, hi, my name is Song Ye, and my final project is about Temporal Wiki, a lifelong benchmark for training and evaluating ever-evolving language models. Recent language models are pre-trained at some specific time point, and they are known to contain vast amount of factual knowledge. However, as time progresses, word knowledge is changed. For example, although the first um, example on the left is unchanged regardless of the time period, the answer to the right example changes according to the time period. Therefore, we need to update the language model periodically to reflect up-to-date knowledge. One nice way to um, update language models is to pre-train uh, language model on the entire corpus, including the original and updated corpus. However, this approach is um, computationally inefficient. An alternative way is to continue pre-train only on the updated corpus. However, this suffers from catastrophical forgetting, a phenomenon which refers to forgetting on uh, original past knowledge. To measure the balance between not forgetting old knowledge and obtaining new knowledge for each time period update, which is referred to as temporal adaptation, we need some public benchmark consisted of training and evaluation data. Also, the most successful method at updating new knowledge without forgetting should be explored. To solve these motivations, we introduced Temporal Wiki, a lifelong benchmark for ever-evolving language models that utilizes the differences between consecutive snapshots of Wikipedia for training and Wikidata for evaluation. Therefore, as you can see in the picture, if a language model is successfully updated after December 2021, it would answer the dominant COVID variant uh, case as Omicron instead of Delta. Our main contributions are as follows. First, a temporal wiki, our benchmark, allows researchers to periodically track a language model's ability with regards to stability and plasticity. Here, stability means not forgetting all knowledge, and plasticity means successfully updating new knowledge. Second, we find that training on the language model on the diff data, which is only the updated corpus, through continual learning methods, achieves similar or better perplexity than on the entire snapshot, which re uh, results in 12 times less computational costs, showing that factual knowledge in language models can be safely updated with minimal training data via continual learning. We construct temporal wiki on a monthly basis automatically, and we include four updates for this experiment, ranging from August 2021 to December 2021. And for training data, we refer to as TWiki diffsets, and for evaluation data, we uh, refer to as TWiki probes. For constructing training data, TWiki diffsets, we compare consecutive Wikipedia dumps. And just like the left picture, we keep track of changed part of text, just like the git diff operation in GitHub. Then we add only the change part to our training data. We found out that the change part is about 13 times smaller than the entire Wikipedia dumps. For constructing evaluation data, TWiki probes, we compare consecutive dumps of Wikidata just like TWiki diff sets. 
we format the data into a triple format, as you can see in the table, um, into subject, relation, and object, and calculate the perplexity for evaluation. And we divide the TVK probes into two sets, unchanged and changed. Also, we ensure that the evaluation instance is included in the training corpus by an alignment filtering. And after uh, alignment and heuristic filtering, we get the final evaluation data. Um, here are the results. We measure the perplexity of our evaluation data, which means the lower is the better. We compare various baseline methods. First, initial refers to the initial checkpoint, and the full refers to uh, training on the entire Wikipedia corpus for every time period. And diff refers to training only on TWiki diff sets, and um, the rest of them, Recadam, Mixed Review, LoRa, and K adapters are all well known continual learning methods. However, we find out that K adapter continual learning method shows the most robust performance across time periods. And also, it is interesting that a Nike diff model outperforms full model for most of the time periods, three out of four with less computation. This is the detailed results. We can see that the full show full model shows good stability, meaning not forgetting much, while however, poor, while poor at obtaining new knowledge, bad plasticity. On the other hand, diff shows the opposite trend, um, bad stability and good plasticity. Especially catastrophic forgetting, it gets worse as more um, time step updates are progressed. Finally, for continually continual learning methods, they show over a good balance of stability and plasticity. For additional analysis, we observe model performance when temporal misalignment occurs, which um, refers to when training and evaluation period is different. Different from full diff, uh, full and diff model, K adapter model perplexity does not increase much even if misalignment occurs. This shows that K adapter model is not is not only good at temporal adaptation, but also robust to temporal misalignment. This is a recap of our contributions. We first introduced a benchmark to evaluate um, language model temporal adaptation ability. We find that uh, training only on the change part with using continual learning methods leads to better or similar performance with much more or less computation cost. We hope that more researchers use our benchmarks for ever evolving language models. Thank you. Are there any questions? Hmm. Um, if not, um, I'll end the presentation. Right. Yeah, thanks for your presentation. So I think the time was exactly 10 minutes, so that's nice. OK, so then let's move to the next one, Soyoung. OK. So, uh, hi everyone, uh, my name is Soyoung Yang, and today I will introduce my new data set, Cont Red, which is Controllable Relation Extraction Document Data Set on Historical Records. I've been working with other collaborators, Min Sok Choi and Young Cho in our lab, and Yeonju Kim, who is in doctorate in major of linguistics and literature of Hanja in Korea University. I guess many of you may be curious about what is CONTRAD. So I will briefly introduce my work from motivation, data construction, and experiments. 
Before we start, I announce that this work is supported by KAIST Industrial Bertram Gigum AI Data Challenge Operation. First, my goal of the research is to study ancient Korean history by using AI. Actually, in Korea, there are huge historical records written in Hanja, including honors of Joseon Dynasty, so called Joseon Wangdo Shilu, and diaries of lawyer secretariat, so called Sung uh, Jung Because of the size of corpus, it requires a tremendous time if only human experts to translate and analyze all the text and build a knowledge database. Therefore, this technique needs AI model to accelerate to the speed of understanding the historical records. Among diverse NLP tests, we choose relation extraction tasks on historical corpus because uh, in historical study, it is a significant task to infer a relationship between uh, person or event. And we can utilize, utilize relation extraction task to find such relationship. Then let's directly see how our, how our data set looks like. Among diverse corpus in ancient Korean records, we choose Yoneng Lo, which is which are travel records when deployment of Joseon visited to Cheong. Cheong is one of the ancient country of China. Let's see the below example. Given a pa pair of sentence in Korean and Hanza, our data set contain named entities and relations. For readability, the entity type is labeled as colors. All the entity and relation is parallel with each other. For example, the green entity in Korean, Yongtong, and one in Hanza in green are connected as parallel relationships. Also, we add metadata, which includes information of books, writer, and translator. We can know the exact date when the writer wrote this day, text. Next, on the other hand, our data, or our data set also contain a document that has multiple sentences and the relation exists across the, uh, across the single sentences. Let's see entity highlighted as green and underlined and bold. In this case, two entity does not exist in a single sentence. Also, there is not direct hint that Kangyang Kwansa and Tony Moon locate nearby each other. This means the model have to guess the context to predict, predict the relation label correctly, not just concentrating a keyword to refer. So these examples show our data set is challenging more than a single sentence level or RE data set. While we started this project because we are interested in historical study, our data set is also useful to NLP researchers because a user can control the input text links. This is the data comparison table. Uh, where the Ithaca is the Ithaca is the ancient Greeks uh, data set published, which opened in Nature 2022. However, this data set does not include any additional information without the raw text. And if we consider the dark red, rectangled, or clue. Uh, we can consider that relation is, we can see that our data set is the first data set that, uh, that is historical data set and also the RE data set. Also, yes, and next. Uh, also, we compare the data set in statistical manner. For, uh, I will skip most of the numbers and we will concentrate on the number of tokens in a document and mean column. For fair comparison, we use multilingual bird tokenizer for all data set to get the number of tokens in a document. document. 
If we set the window size as one, which is the where the window size will be explained in later section, uh, the average number of tokens in a document is larger than a clue of RE data set. Therefore, we can conclude that our data set contains much longer sentences in document level. Then come back to the starting point. How have you built such data set you have been observed? Since building on RE data set on historical corpus has never been started before, we have to build data set schema, such as named entity types and relation types. When we conduct the schema, we consider two aspects. First is we have to share the general entity and or relation types on previous data sets. Second is the types would maintain its domain knowledge. After discussion with three professors in the domain, we finally set 10, entity, 10 named entity types and 20 relation types. After we build schema and collect raw text, to, raw text to annotate, we recruit annotators who can understand the parallel Korean and Hansa corpus and have studied the linguistics and literature of Hansa more than four years. As a result, we, we as a result, 20 annotators are joined in this project. Then how the annotators work? First, the annotators are given Hanja text and Korean text where the Korean is translated version of Hanja. And they annotate the named entity in Korean and Hanja and connect the par parallel relationship. And in the Korean text, they con connect the relationship between the named entities. Also, they add you can see in here, they add evidence sentence for each Korean and Hanja. And lastly, they add a co-reference class. Uh, after the annotation is finished, we extract sentences that contain relations. Make and make various documents by manipulating window size based on Korean sentences. Let the document in step one is fourth sentence uh, inclu include uh, fourth sentence in a text. If window size equal one, the new document contains third, fourth, fifth sentences in the text. Note that when adding a sentence, we also add entity and relations if exists. Also, we add parallel Hansa sentence using parallel relationship in entity and relation. So uh, as since the time is running out, <laughs> we will, uh, in this presentation, we will show experimental results on covert and Asian Chinese bird. When we train a model only varying the window size of the data set, we can, you can see the average number of tokens per document. Uh, we, you, we can see that the F1 scores gets lower as the length of the input sequence longer. In Hunter data set, the tendency is similar with the Korean data set. However, since the average number of tokens per document is much smaller than the Korean one, we can see that the worst score is higher than the Korean one. As a this are not robust to the, uh, to the length of the sequence. To sum up my presentation, our work can be summarized as two points. First, we introduce a historical RE date document data set with a close cooperation of domain experts. Second, our data set can be a test bed by varying the length of the input test. However, our data set has two limitations. Since Yonin Rook is a terrible rep travel report, the domain is specific, and the size of overall data set is not that big. Therefore, we plan two future works uh, to expand the, co expand the corpus to AJD and DRS and implement a dif distanced provision to amplify the data set. 
and I uh, I add the references which are highly related to our work. And thanks, this is my presentation. Thank you. All right, thanks. I have just one quick question. So uh, you're saying that there is a window size of zero. So what does that mean? It means that you're just looking at the word, the current word only and no other word? Uh, in here, the window size is the, like, if we, uh, if we have the total text has uh, 10, 10 sentences and among the 10 sentences, if we have relation at first one, first sentence one, we add the document, the, we construct the window size zero document as the first sentences single, single sentence. And the window size is the Korean sentence level. So if the window size is one, we add the front and back sentence sentence based on the window size zero. Sentence. Yeah, because I thought that definition is quite, um, well, I mean, maybe it's not, too wrong, but then maybe it's good to double check because I think when I say when I think of window size one, I think of one word or one one token or one sentence, and window size of three being basically um, total size being three. So it's like what so what you said window size equal to one seems like more of a window size three to me. I think it's good uh, to double check though. I think um, yeah, yeah. Maybe I'm wrong, but yeah. you should yeah, probably uh, use a correct terminology. Oh, thank you. Yeah, because it, it's kind of weird to say it's some window size zero, I think. Uh, yeah, I I think I should revise this word. Okay, anyways. Okay, thank you. All right, yeah, okay, yeah, thanks a lot for your presentation. So, okay, yeah, thanks a lot. So hopefully, uh, I think you haven't submitted the report, so uh, please submit um, soon and we'll start grading it. And I think that's it for this um, class. So thanks a lot, everyone. So um, hopefully, um, um, yeah, we'll see you again in the other classes too. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you.